Hello, everyone. Welcome to our afternoon press event on Hunga Volcano. Sorry for the uh, rearrangement of the schedule this morning. The morning briefing on space helicopters will be at 2 p.m. in this room. So if you're interested in that, please hang out for that event at 2 p.m. And the, three, the 2 p.m. roundtable on OSIRIS-REx sample return will be at 3 p.m. in the roundtable room. So if you're interested in that, please attend with us at 3 p.m. Um, so welcome to you all. Um, our five panelists are gonna give their presentations all in a row. And after they're done, we will open the floor to questions from the audience here in the room and also online. My colleague Becca in the back will be handling the moderation of those questions online. So if you are online, feel free to put a question, your name and your question into the Q&A box at any time. Let us know if you would like us to read your question or if you'd like us to open your mic. And with that, I'd like to introduce the panel. Introduce yourselves. <laughs> Okay, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Chris Vygaski. I'm a meteorologist at Vaisala Inc. in Colorado. Hi, um, I'm Larry Paxton. I'm with the Applied Physics Laboratory. I do space science. Hi, everyone. I'm Claire Gasquay. I'm a graduate student at the University of California, Berkeley, and I work on space science as well. Uh, my name is uh, Yin Chai Chen. I'm from University of Houston. I worked on the seismic waves excited by the volcanic eruption. My name is Sharon Walker. I'm with the Pacific Marine Environmental Laboratory in Seattle, Washington. And I'll be talking about an expedition that we did to measure the actual uh, ongoing activity under the surface of the ocean uh, during July and August of this year. There we go. This is not my slide, but uh... hey, there we go. All right, so we'll kick it off here talking about uh, volcanic lightning. And we're answering the question, did the eruption of Hunga Volcano, and Hunga Volcano is how it is known to the Tongan Geologic Survey, uh, did it produce the greatest concentration of lightning ever detected? And the Short and dirty of it is, yes, it did. And we'll get into this a little bit uh, here as we move on. And the clicker is moving a little slow. So we'll wait for the slides to catch up with me. Uh, so there's me, uh, I'm a meteorologist, lightning applications manager for Vysalax weather. Uh, basically means I get to play with lightning data all day and see what kind of cool things we can come up to do with uh, the lightning data. So volcanoes are a global hazard that require global monitoring. There's about 50 volcanoes that are erupting every day, about 80 volcanoes that are erupting around the world every year. Uh, this number comes from the Smithsonian Global Volcanism Program. And across the, the globe, there's about 80 volcanoes that have produced volcanic lightning. Uh, so we are able to detect the electromagnetic waves that lightning produces uh, and geolocate those with uh, high accuracy and we have seen in about 80 volcanoes uh, that there is volcanic lightning. The data source that we're going to be using for the uh, study today is uh, Vaisala's global lightning data set, GLD360. It detects just about 100% of thunderstorms around the globe uh, in volcanoes, wildfires, regular thunderstorms, tropical storms, uh, even all the way at the North Pole in 2019. Lightning was detected just uh, 52 kilometers from the North Pole. And we'll wait for this next slide. There we go. And GLD360, it's a global lightning location network that detects more than 2 billion, 2 billion with a B, lightning events around the world every year. A lightning event uh, is what we consider a cloud to ground stroke or an in cloud pulse. Those are the components of lightning flashes. Uh, each event sends out an impulsive charge of electricity that then sends an electromagnetic signal around the world at the speed of light. Our sensors are focused on the very low frequency range, which bounce between the Earth and the ionosphere, so that we can detect lightning up to 10,000 kilometers away. GLD360 will tell us whether it's in cloud or cloud to ground, how powerful it was, so how much current was running through that lightning, uh, and it determines the uh, peak current. 
and we detect more than 80% of the cloud to ground lightning that occurs around the world every year. So this fantastic loop is GLD360 lightning data every five minutes during the January 15th eruption. Now you can see just how much lightning occurred and some distinctive lightning rings, uh, which is the focus of some study as, as it's going on right now. Uh, so when the volcano started erupting back in December of 2021, with each eruptive episode, it was producing volcanic lightning. And through the uh, early part of January, it had produced about 60 to 70,000 volcanic lightning events, making it one of the most prolific lightning producers already. Uh, in is paled in comparison to events like uh, Anak Krakatau in 2018 or Fukutoku in 2021, but it was still a good lightning producer. And then on January 13th to 14th, an explosive eruption produced around 200,000. But even that paled in comparison to the January 15th event when we detected 400,000 lightning events in that eruption. And really interestingly was at its peak, half of the global lightning that was detected was detected at the volcano itself. But the extreme lightning rates, and we were getting lightning rates of up to 5,000 to 5,200 events per minute. That's an order of magnitude higher than you would see in supercell thunderstorms. So some of the strongest thunderstorms that exist on this planet. Because these rates were so high, we were saturating our sensors. Uh, so the sensors send back 100 events per second to conserve bandwidth in some remote locations. So the 400,000 number on January 15th that we give you, that's actually the floor of the value. And we're working to figure out just how much we missed and how many events there actually were in the event. But even though we undercounted some of the lower peak current events, the Hunga volcano had the highest lightning density that we've seen in any other storm, uh, including other volcanic events like uh, Anak Krakatau in 2018. So if you think of Lake Maracaibo, the lightning capital of the world, they get about 290 events per square kilometer per year. This volcano, when you annualize the uh, number of the lightning density, was 44,000, almost 45,000 events per square kilometer. So at its peak between January 13th and 15th, this was the most extreme lightning event that had ever been detected by the global network. So nearly 600,000 lightning events across those three days. And again, that is a, that's the floor. We're working to figure out exactly how many we may have missed. The peak lightning rates are an order of magnitude higher than supercell thunderstorms. So these volcanic thunderstorms, when they do produce lightning, can produce the greatest concentration of lightning anywhere on the planet. And the Hunga event was the greatest concentration ever detected. And this has implications on the global electrical circuit and regional lightning density. And all of these things are being worked out and published in uh, the coming months as well. So. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, happy to take any questions after we get through the presentations, and then there's my contact information as well. That's a good one. All right. Uh, so I'm going to try to tell you something about a, a kind of way of looking at the world that we don't normally think about. I'm going to talk about far ultraviolet radiation. So your human eye sees from about 40 nanometers to 700 nanometers. 40 nanometers is violet, 700 nanometers is red. What we're going to talk about is 100 to 200 nanometers, so ultraviolet. And the really neat thing about this is this is light that doesn't make it from space down to the surface of the Earth. In fact, this light stops really high up in the atmosphere. It stops above the boundary to space, which is at about 100 kilometers or 60 miles up. So when we see things happen in the far ultraviolet, what we're seeing is processes that happen in space, not on the ground. So the sensors are carefully designed that we don't see to the ground. So that's what I'm going to talk about. And of course, I represent a very large team, of, well, not a very large team, a long-lived team, let's put it that way, uh, for the Gooby and Susie instruments. And I'll tell you a little bit about it. 
So what the theme here is we're going to look at the interaction between the surface, the atmosphere, and space. And when you look at these data, this is a swath that was obtained by the instrument as it went around in its orbit. It's making these sort of push broom scans. And right here was something unusual. And this is something that you see in the far ultraviolet. So you're not seeing any of the surface features as you see this orbit go by. And we use this to obtain space data to look at things like auroral storms, geomagnetic disturbances, solar flares, and impacts on the Earth's upper atmosphere. So many scientific inquiries have already started with the idea, well, hey, that's interesting. That's something I didn't expect to see. And when we look at data, we've been taking data for more than 20 years, and we typically see a pass that looks like what I have over here on the uh, far side of the chart, a smooth thing. And if I compare it to the day of the eruption, I see a big divot in the feature right there. And you think, well, why is that? I wouldn't expect to see anything. It's a volcano. It's down on the surface of the Earth. If I see an absorber, that means that if I see that hole, that means that something got up above the boundary to space and sucked up those photons that would normally get sent to my eye or to the, sea, to the sensor. What happened? So that's the story we're going to tell you. So here's the uh, volcano eruption the Tonga volcano eruption. You see that in the visible. When we look in the visible, of course, we're seeing all the way down to the ground. And there again in that cartoon is the boundary to space, the Carmen line at 100 kilometers. I'm going to try to speak bilingually both in kilometers and miles. Uh, when we talk about the ultraviolet, though, the normal way that we see things is what's happening in the upper atmosphere, the thermosphere, ionosphere, and sometimes down into the mesosphere. And so that purple arrow the violet arrow there shows you that the far ultraviolet doesn't see down below that line in space. So normally, when we look at volcanoes, we don't see anything. We see waves maybe that are generated that propagate upward like waves in the ocean. We see those in space, but we don't see the volcano itself. So to be visible in the far ultraviolet, the, the eruption had to create something that went all the way past the edge of space. So imagine lifting, you know, hundreds of thousands of metric tons of water, creating a spot. That spot there was as big as Montana or Germany or Japan, creating that in space. So how do we do that? Well, so when we look at this, what we're really seeing, of course, is that this radiation, you see the plume is presumed to have made it all the way up into the, past this boundary of space, and some of the light is absorbed and some of it is seen by the sensor. Now, let's take a look at the scene that we're looking at. So what I'm showing here is, of course, the, the Tonga volcano over here. And the sun is off to this side. The arrows point towards where the sun would be. This little red square shows, sets the scene. And I'm going to show a couple of images. That same kind of orbit image that I showed you at the beginning, that's what I'm going to show here in this picture. So now let's take a look and see what it looks like. So what you see here, again, that's sort of that familiar divot that I showed, that decrease in the intensity that you saw. But let's zoom up on it because, of course, it's a little hard to see. So remember, this is about the size of uh, Japan, Germany, or the state of Montana. And you can imagine that if I cover an area that large with something, you know, it doesn't take a lot before you get a huge amount of mass. Now, the question is, the thing that we still haven't understood and explored is how was this extraordinary volcano, which released about 60 megatons of TNT and energy, how was it able to push that much water vapor up into space? And I think part of the rarity of this was that this was a subterranean volcano. We're going to hear later on about, about the subterranean volcano in just a second. But uh, what you see is this large hole here in the feature. So now let's take a look. We can slice this. Now, it turned out we had three instruments that flew over this just in succession. It was just a random chance. We were lucky for once. And we saw this. So we take a slice of this divot that's as big as Montana. And what we see is this hole in the radiance, the brightness feature. So the center of that hole is right over the Tonga volcano. Satellite didn't know that. The data shows it was right over that volcano. The width, sort of indicated by that other arrow, shows how wide it was, and that's how we calculate the area. So if we look at this, these are, turns out to be hyperspectral sensors. That means every time we take an image, we record the spatial information and the spectral 
information in what's called a data cube, a hypercube of information. And from that, we can determine what the composition was likely to be. And so we have features at many, many different wavelengths. And here's a slice where we look at another feature in uh, an emission. And what you notice here is that see this, notice it's a little hard for me to point, but there's a normal curve and then you see that little divot, it's not as deep. And that difference in the amount of light that was sucked out of the medium tells you about the composition. And that points to it being water vapor. So now we've got different pieces of the puzzle. We know that it was water vapor from a number of different things. We know here, by the way, that there were huge waves that were created in the atmosphere. The water vapor turns out on the night side creates a hole in the ionosphere as well. And we can tell about how much it was. So we get this 20,000 to 200,000 tons of metric tons of material was lifted up 100 kilometers up in the space, 60 miles above the earth. Now, how do we do this? Of course, I want to just sort of conclude with this. The thing is that these instruments have been flying for 20 years, and these are once in a lifetime kind of observations. It isn't often that we see a big volcano like this. It gives us a unique insight into the past history of the earth and other planets, as well as into our own home. And this is much a human adventure. You know, people worked on these instruments. We did this, I've been working on this for 30 years. And these are relatively small instruments. They do their thing. They produce knowledge all the time. I just want to remind everybody, of course, this is, a, this is the result of a long-term standing commitment by uh, NASA and uh, the Air Force Defense Meteorological Satellite Program. Program began in, uh, you know, uh, 30 years ago. Uh, 26,000 uh, citations of this work has been done and over 2,000 papers have been written on this. I wanted to thank the team members and also extend the wish best wishes to a friend of mine who's worked on this for a long time who's having trouble. So thank you very much. Those are not my slides. Well, that's mine. Do you want to go next? Should, go, we... should I go next, Lisa? I guess I'll go. All right. Sorry about that. No worries. Go for it. All right, so we're a little out of order, but I'm Sharon Walker with the Pacific Marine Environmental Laboratory in Seattle, Washington. I'm here with my colleague uh, today, Cornel Durand from GNS Science in New Zealand, who initiated this part of the project that we were involved in. There are two main points that I'm going to emphasize during this short presentation. The first one is that there was an impressive amount of information that was rapidly available from all the Earth observing systems in place at the time of the eruption. But what was happening beneath the ocean surface was a complete mystery. Early data showed that the, there was a dramatic depth increase in the center of the volcano, but there was no way of confirming if the eruption had completely stopped or if there was ongoing risk or what that risk might be. The second thing is how we address this mystery was equally important as to the re result that we obtained. A conventional method for uh, responding to submarine eruptions is to send a ship with teams of scientists on board to map the seafloor and plumes of the eruption, take samples and analyze them. And that's exactly what happened during the first phase of the project. But due to safety concerns, they were restricted to operating completely outside the caldera. The second phase enlisted a robot boat to map and sample the caldera. And I'll explain further why this was such an extraordinary thing to do after I show you some of the results that we obtained. This image summarizes our data and the main results. The red colors show the areas of the highest turbidity, which is particles in the water column. And the particles could be ash or hydrothermal precipitates. The blue colors represent typical background values. The pink and purple symbols and yellow lines, which I know are a little bit hard to see in this slide, but I'll show you more about that in the next one, um, identify the lo and locate the areas of active venting. These data confirm that A, there was ongoing eruptive and or hydrothermal venting and volcanic degassing within the caldera at least six months after the powerful explosive eruption on January 15th, 2022. The activity was focused near each island on the north side of the caldera and along the eastern caldera wall, 
but the plume was widespread throughout the caldera deeper than about 150 meters. The only places for the plume to escape from these depths are two breaches in the caldera walls. One is on the north between where uh, the islands where the land bridge used to be, which is about 180 meters deep, and the other is on the east side, where the depth is about 280 meters. Because of the geometry of the caldera, it traps most of the plume inside of it. The turbidity increase uh, intensity did not diminish during the 34 days that we were on site, which if it had would have indicated that part particles were settling and not being replenished. But that was not the case. So that was one clue of the ongoing activity. OK, when I remove the turbidity, you can clearly see what our chemical sensor revealed. The yellow ovals in this image generally locate places where the seafloor mapping team, using sound, detected bubbles coming from the seafloor. The pink and purple dots identify locations where our chemical sensors showed the presence of volcanic and hydrothermal compounds like dissolved hydrogen, hydrogen sulfide, and iron. And hydrogen in particular is generated by lava seawater interactions. These compounds are relatively short-lived, and so their presence confirms the ongoing or fresh activity. You can see that along the eastern caldera wall, none of those signals exist. Instead, the chemical indica indication was that that area was dominated by carbon dioxide degassing. Carbon dioxide increases the density and acidity of seawater. And so in combination with the deep hole that's now largely isolated from the surrounding ocean, it's possible that over time, there could be potentially dangerous concentrations of carbon dioxide could accumulate. And at this point, it's difficult to predict if this setting could lead to the kind of disaster that occurred at Lake Neos in Cameroon in 18, 1986. But the increased acidity in combination with the high particulates would most definitely affect the type of organisms that can survive in this environment as the site recovers. So one takeaway is it's going to be important to monitor this volcano with all the tools that we have available to us moving forward. And I'm gonna shift gears and talk a little bit about the remarkable effort that it was to acquire this data. The really exciting part about how we did it is that this was, to my knowledge, the very first time that an uncrewed vessel has successfully completed or even attempted an operation of this scope and complexity. We used the uncrewed surface vessel Max Lemur from Seakit International. It was entirely 100% remotely operated from 16,000 kilometers away from the study site. The team of mapping specialists and scientists who participated from our home locations were, ever, were located all around the world. <clears throat> the direct water column me measurements and sensors specific for plume mapping were made possible by attaching our instruments to a custom built frame integrated with a winch that was controlled by the operators all the way in the UK. We completed four missions, resulting in a very comprehensive water column plume mapping survey that comprised 30 vertical casts and eight toyos. A toyo, visit this slide again, is where the wire is continuously fed out and reeled back in while the vessel moves forward at a fixed rate of speed. The real-time operational status and vessel data, including the winch status, was available to all participants through a, uh, a web-based dashboard application. This also had a separate link so that we could actually download the data. We communicated 24-7 with WhatsApp instant messaging. Operational plans could be discussed and altered as conditions required. It really was a truly remarkable next level remote work experience. So in summary, the work is important because of both the results and the major technical accomplishments to complete it. The volcano was still active after six months of the, after the devastating eruption. The activity is likely lower level intensity volcanic eruption, but could also have a hydrothermal component due to seawater circling through still cooling lava. There's a significant degassing of carbon dioxide, another volcanic gas. Particles in carbon dioxide are accumulating within the new 850 meter deep 
submarine caldera, which will likely impact ecosystem recovery. There's a potential for a Lake Neo style hazard, which is similar to what the Colombo submarine volcano in the Santorini volcanic field in Greece is con they're concerned about. This also demonstrates the need for continued monitoring and not just this volcano, because there are hundreds like it around the world and many are near vulnerable coastal communities. So thank you. And of course, thanks to all of our partners who made this possible and collaborated with us. And I'll be happy to take your questions after we all finish. I left it up there. I don't know. Thank you. Sorry. I forgot to pass the torch. Figure out what slides are next. Do we have more slides? Okay, one minute. <laughs> folks, we seem to have a technical malfunction, but we're going to take a couple questions on those who have spoken while we load the missing slide decks. Apologies for that. Um, does anyone in the room have questions for those who have already spoken? John, you right there. A couple of uh, questions for our uh, different panelists. Um, Sharon, if I could start with you. Sorry, Jonathan Amos, BBC News in London. Um, uh, the, uh, the, the Neos volcano disaster in 86 was obviously, um, it was villages around the, I remember it well, villages around the volcano, carbon dioxide came over the top um, and displaced the air in, in those villages and that's what killed so many people. What, what, is, the, what is the possibility that could, could happen uh, here? Because most of the, the sea floor around the, the volcano today is pretty dead. Um, because they've all been smothered. Um, there's not an awful lot. There are pockets of life for sure, sponges and stuff. I think the TESMAP um, survey found. But um, what, what is the um, what is the the possibility that we we could see that you're describing? And then uh, for Larry, uh, there was a Nature paper. I think there was a Science Advances paper, maybe uh, a few weeks ago, which was saying that the um, the emission from the the volcano went into the mesosphere. You, you seem to be suggesting um, that the water vapor went even higher uh, than it went above the Kármán line. I mean, the, the the line I've been using for um, you know the better part of the year is that it went halfway to space. Well, you're telling me today that it went to space. Yeah, definitely. Sorry, did you want me to answer right now? How can I stop? So yeah, so so again, it depends on you know one of the things that's unusual about these sensors is that they're designed very carefully to just see in the far ultraviolet, so they see just down to the edge of space, and other sensors are designed and optimized for other regions of of the atmosphere or the surface, and so when I read these reports about uh, you know early thing early reports about oh, getting up into the stratosphere and then people went and looked at their data and it's ah oh, it gets a little higher than the stratosphere it starts to get into the mesosphere, and then I like. You know, yeah, it's such an extraordinary thing that you start to look at this range of sensors that we have for probing our understanding of the coupled surface or subsurface environment all the way out to space. And we're able to the first time paint a picture. That would be the message I would take away from this is this is really our first opportunity to see this as a coupled system. But again, the sensors are designed for a particular thing. So just like uh, I can't see what happens in the mesosphere with these sensors. They can't really tell how far up it goes into the into the thermosphere is what I would assert. So that maybe is part of the reason why we have to both look at it as a coupled system of, of problems, mm -hmm. but also why people are sort of expanding their understanding of the phenomenon as well. Hope that makes sense. Sure. Can you please repeat your question again for me? I please try so, to speak yeah, up. Yeah, so the, the, the question was, is the, um, the concentration of, of, of CO2 within the caldera, um, you, you said that that needs monitoring because we could get a, a repeat of the, uh, the, the NEOS event in, in 86, right? So, but I mean, that was a, a subaerial volcano, right? I mean, that was on land, 
of carbon dioxide comes over the sides, uh, kills people in the villages as it displaces air. I mean, this is this is a submarine volcano. Um, so if, if the impacts, I guess, are for submarine life, uh, right? Even though this this area around the volcano is is pretty dead uh, today, it seems. I didn't hear. I'm sorry. I really didn't hear that. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Try again. Try again. One more time. That's better. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. No. So we're talking about the the concentration of, of CO2 in the waters in the caldera, um, and you said that, that it's a, a potential repeat in the future if this continues of the NEOS event in 86, which was um, a subaerial volcano, a volcano on land with the carbon dioxide coming over the top, displacing air in the villages, killing people. So I'm saying, what, what, is, what is the scenario that, that you're looking to avoid or avoid, but could happen in the future with, this is a submarine volcano. So everything is, is un, underwater, right? So, so the activity is all submarine right now. And, um, there are, there are literally hundreds of submarine volcanoes like it around the world. And we have actually observed several of them while they've been erupting. Um, and it takes a significant amount of power to see that kind of eruption and the impacts of it travel all the way to space. Um, one of the most remarkable things about this volcano is how um, explosive it was. And there are a number of ideas about why that's the case. Um, when lava interacts with seawater, you can have what they call a fuel coolant reaction, which helps enhance the um, explosivity of it. Uh, with the volcano or the activity now under at least a couple hundred meters of water, it's going to take that much more air energy to create a similar kind of impact. Um, the other eruptions that we've watched in progress have been at 500 meters deep and 1500 meters deep. And they've been a lower level intensity of eruption and the water has cooled the lava more quickly and it has, uh, the pressure has suppressed the explosivity of it. But when you have a situation like at the Hunga Volcano, where this is all happening very close to the surface, there's not a lot of water to, to suppress, a lot of pressure from the water to suppress that powerful explosion. And so that's one of the reasons why the explosion could be detected all the way to space. Does that answer your question? It doesn't. Don't mind. I'll come back. OK. We will come back to that question. We are good to go with Dr. Claire Gass. You're good. Speaking of the effects of the volcano going all the way to space, let's let's keep talking about that. All right, this one and that. Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. I'm Claire Gasquay. I'm a graduate student at the University of California, Berkeley, uh, and today I'm going to talk about some unprecedented observations from NASA satellites, uh, which reveal how the Hunga volcanic eruption affected space weather. All right, does this work? Yes. Okay. Fantastic. Um, so you've already heard a little bit about what the eruption did in the lower atmosphere, as well as some of the effects in the ionosphere. Um, but now let's look uh, at some other aspects of what it uh, did in the ionosphere. So first, a little bit of background. So again, the edge of space, it's around 60 miles or 100 kilometers up. Uh, and there's two parts to it. So first, there's the neutral atmosphere, which is called the thermosphere. Um, and so that's made of uh, neutral particles, just like the air that we breathe. But up there, you also have a plasma, which is called the ionosphere. And those are electrons and ions, so they're charged particles. And those are going to react to the magnetic field and also electric fields up there. So they behave completely differently than the neutral particles in the thermosphere. Um, one of the, the special things about this region is the two different components, the plasma and the neutrals, can actually interact with each other. For example, if there are winds in the neutral atmosphere, they can collide with the plasma that can create electric fields in a process called the, uh, the dynamo, the ionospheric dynamo, which I'm going to return to a little bit later. So when the volcano erupted, it released a massive amount of energy into the lower atmosphere. And some of that energy was able to propagate up all the way up into this thermosphere ionosphere system up into space. Um, 
There, it was able to generate some of the largest neutral winds we've ever observed at certain altitudes. Um, and it also affected the plasma in the ionosphere, creating unusual electric currents and electric fields. Um, so overall, it changed the weather in space. That's the broad overview. Now let me tell you a little bit about the measurements that we actually made. Okay, so NASA's Ionospheric Connection Explorer, or ICON satellite, was actually designed to study how the ionosphere can be affected either from above, so by solar storm type influences, or from below by regular tides in the atmosphere or large events like this volcanic eruption. Um, so it's actually an ideal tool to help us understand this event. So ICON orbits roughly around the equator um, and it has instruments both to measure what the neutral winds are doing in the neutral atmosphere and also how the plasma is behaving. So it can help us understand the connection between these two systems. Within an hour of the eruption, ICON passed within about 4,000 kilometers of the volcano. Um, so this is the track, and this is actually much farther away than anything in the neutral atmosphere, any disturbances would have, would have reached. So this circle here represents how far the disturbance in the neutral atmosphere got when ICON was going by. But the thing is, when you're measuring the plasma, you have to take the magnetic field into account. So this diagram down here shows you the magnetic field line, the ICON observatory is on one end of the field line, and over here is the disturbance in the neutral atmosphere from the volcano. So what happens is when you disturb the plasma on one end of the magnetic field line, it's like plucking a guitar string. So that disturbance is going to propagate to the other end of the field line within seconds, about three seconds in this case. So even though the neutral atmosphere is being perturbed uh, closer to the volcano, right, you're getting the plasma being disturbed thousands of kilometers away. Um, and so some of my colleagues were able to show that after the eruption, uh, the volcano still had an effect very far away from this. All right, so let's see. So what are the actual measurements that we took? Oh, sorry. So yeah, so even though icons there, that's the path. The red line there is the path uh, that is magnetically connected. So you see that cuts right through where the disturbance was. Okay, so here are some of the actual measurements that we took. So these are plasma drifts. Uh, which show how the plasma is moving at ICON's location, both up and down vertically and also east-west. Um, and so the region that's highlighted is the region that was connected magnetically to that region affected by the volcano. Um, and the gray lines that you see here are what we would normally expect to observe at these times. And so you can see in the areas that are connected to the volcano, we see these huge deviations from what's normal. Um, and that's as a result of what the volcano was doing. Uh, these graphs actually tell another story too. You'll notice that even before the satellite got to the, the region that was affected by the volcano, uh, this eastward drift in particular was already very different than what, what we would expect. Um, that's actually likely due to the geomagnetic storm, which happened on January 14th. So there was a coronal mass ejection um, that caused a moderate geomagnetic storm the day before the eruption. So suddenly we have these competing influences. Right, we have this geomagnetic storm that's trying to control the ionosphere. At the same time, we have this volcano going off affecting the ionosphere as well. Um, in this case, close to the volcano, it's, it's the volcanic influences that are dominating. And again, even hours after the eruption, at least in the equatorial ionosphere, uh, it seemed to be volcanic influences that were dominating even very far from the volcano. Um, so while most people think of space weather as being caused by solar influences, so large storms, uh, this is showing that from below, the volcano can also affect space weather almost just as much, especially in the equatorial regions. Um, just a few more quick details on how this actually happened, in case you're, you're interested in those. So the signature that we're seeing is likely due to the ionospheric dynamo, which I mentioned before. So what happens is you have waves generated in the atmosphere by the eruption. These are analogous either to sound waves or ocean waves. There's different types. Um, they caused extreme neutral winds. Some of my colleagues also showed in their paper that even hours after the eruption, these winds are exceeding about 200 meters per second, which is 450 miles per hour, um, up at around 120 kilometers. So these winds, like I say, they're colliding with the plasma and through the dynamo effect, they're creating electric fields that are then transmitted along the magnetic field lines to the location of our satellite, and it's causing these extreme drifts. So the volcano is, is showing us the interconnection of this system and creating different electric effects um, as a result. Okay, so here I was only able to really scratch the surface of what we know about the eruptions effect in the ionosphere. There's actually a lot more here to talk about. 
Um, the community is still engaged in ongoing studies of the data and also modeling efforts to better understand this event um, and how we can actually use this event to improve our understanding of this whole system. Uh, so thank you for your time. Feel free to contact me or ask questions later. Hey everybody, uh, my name is uh, Yin Chai Chen. I'm um, from University of Houston, and this is a very large uh, team effort uh, to analyze various aspects of this volcano. But today I'm only going to talk to you about the seismic effects. Okay, you have heard all these powerful events, but here I'm going to take you to the kitchen and to look at what's under the surface. So the key point is this is a very violent eruption. You know, we usually think this magnitude of, of eruption would be in a runaway fashion. So, however, as I can show you from data, this event is a highly regulated event. Okay. So it has actually composed of four episodic events of very uh, similar waveforms. And we, each event, each sub-event was actually started by upward force in a subsurface hammering the caldera, we call that magma hammer force. So this is the event. So, you know, this, you have seen this probably many times. So I wanna point out, you know, this is the USGS reported a magnitude 5.8 earthquake, uh, 414, 45 seconds, January 15th. And uh, here's a brief timeline about this volcano. It's actually uh, the, the early caldera forming eruption is about 900 years ago. Then we have 1912. Uh, I cannot see it, uh, but, but you can show the, see those, these are like 20, 2009, 2014, 15. And all the way to last year, 2021, um, the plume heights actually scale, okay? So it's interpretable. So to, uh, you know, December 20th, it lasted all the way to early 2022. And there are two eruptions, January 13th and January 15th. Okay, the January 13th also produced a pretty tall plume with lightning events. The January 15th is the main one. And for the January 13 one, we didn't observe any global seismic wave field generated, but the January 15 one is the powerful one. Actually, the seismic event uh, started, didn't start the volcano. It's in the middle of the eruption. Okay, the, the eruption started about 402. The seismic event started about 415. So then with, you know, uh, this plume heights, you can see the yellow lines, the lightning events. Um, and this is two hours after uh, 4.30 uh, all the way to 6.30, just showing you the plume height and uh, lightning. So this event generated the seismic waves captured by the global seismic network. Um, the data is from IRIS, which is a very good um, organization, they archive all the data. So you can see a lot of stations, the blue triangles available. So we were able to analyze more than 400 um, uh, stations. So here show the raw data. The vertical axis is time, the horizontal axis is the distance between the station to the volcanic uh, uh, center. So you can see the parallel lines, the first one around 700 seconds that's a P wave, the second one, second one, uh, second P wave, third one, and the fourth one. So you can see those are parallel events. Of course, you go further, the time needed is more. And, uh, you know, those waves are the P waves traveling through the Earth mantle. Here, you know, showing the diagram of the ray path. The yellow part is the mantle of the, of the Earth. So we can pick the rivals, we can line them up, and uh, now you have a better visual 
uh, visualization. You can see the first uh, uh, UFT event is here, the second one, third one, and fourth one. So because these register similar waveforms, that we just add them together, and you can see they're highly similar waveforms, the first event, the second event, and third event. And all this happened within 300 seconds. And each, each event has four stages, okay? Three seconds, 15 seconds, or three seconds, or three seconds. So four stages, highly regulated um, sequence. And that's why we call them uh, episodic events. And uh, further analysis showed that the source is symmetric, okay? Basically means these waves are not caused by earthquake mechanisms or landslide mechanism. The second one is four events are repeated events with highly similar waveforms. And each event is started by upward single force under the volcano. So this upward force is, is very enigmatic phenomenon. And, and uh, we struggled a lot to understand what causes this force. So right now our mechanism is that there is a pulse of magma coming from below. And this magma chamber, by the way, the depth of which is unknown now. And uh, gravity analysis showed it's at least deeper than six kilometers. So if there is a pulse of magma going up through those uh, channels, hit the base of the volcano, that can generate uh, the force, okay? This force, we can constrain the magnitude of the force based on seismic wave analysis. It's about 10 to the 13 Newton, which is a stronger than Mount St. Helen 1980 eruption. Okay, so we call this magma hammer force. And we can compute the flux you know, from the conduit and we can compare the flux with the flux estimated in the air by the discharge um, equation. Here's the plume height. Here's Q is the discharge rate you, times density of the discharge rate. You got a mass. Um, mass uh, discharge rate. So which is about um, uh, 1.4 times 10 to the nine kilograms per second. Okay, this is a very, a lot of uh, eruption. Uh, because magma hammer force is vertical, so it uh, actually is consistent with some recent uh, bathymetry map. So it shows from 150 meter below water all the way to 850 meters. So that's my um, last slide, just to show it's uh, consistent with the bathymetry. Okay, so the key message is, despite it's a violent eruption, but this volcanic eruption is, is, uh, has four highly regulated sub-events, mm -hmm. a sequence of them, and each one has highly regulated stages. An order of seconds, so I think, uh, you know, more research is going to be done to understand why this is the case. This is the first time we saw this upward force. Previous events, we only saw downward force first. So thank you very much. I think we have time for maybe one quick question before we have to set up for the two o'clock. One or two quick questions. Anyone in the room? We see your hands and questions from the reporters in the room. John. So just so that I can be uh, clear, this, this hammer that you're talking about. So that magma chamber is, is pushing up, right? Yeah, and that's what's happening. Yes. Uh, that's what- Four episodes. Thought. Four yes. episodes, it's punching yes. up. Correct. Yeah. And, well, and that's our interpretation so far. Right. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Otherwise, it's very difficult to reconcile, you know, based on seismic observations, it's very clear. It's upward mechanism. Right. And what, what drives that? I mean, what could drive that? I think it could be a, like a new batch of magma suddenly just breach into the magma chamber and overpressurize the magma chamber. So a pulse of the, you know, magma can be traveling up at high speed, then hit, it's like a train hit the base, hit the wall. 
So just hammer it four times within 300 seconds. And plus, you know, because January 13 eruption and uh, this eruption actually started at least 13 minutes before the seismic events, that means there is already a connected conduit from the magma chamber to the uh, caldera. So that means there's a channel already established. So if there's overpressure in a subsurface, so that will squeeze the magma to go up, to hit the base four times. Great. Good. Thank you, panel. Thank you all for being here. Uh, this has been recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel this afternoon, AGU's YouTube channel under fall meeting press events. We also post that to the press information exchange, which you can find on the press center pages. And if you have any questions, you can reach us at news at agu.org. Thank you all for coming. Take a glass.